Hi everybody, I'm Trish Christ. In this episode of Our Nashville, Nikat and our super crew of teenagers spend some time with the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. Vice President Lisa Purcell and her co-workers are going to show and tell us all the cool things they do in our community. Are you ready, Lisa? Ready. Are you ready, super crew? Yes. Let's make a show. Ready? It's our Nashville. 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 We all know how to talk about our organization during meetings, but what about the chance encounter of a lifetime? You never know who may share your next elevator, notice your logo on a notebook or a tote bag, and ask what you do. What's the clearest, most persuasive thing you can say in a short elevator ride? The Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum is a global arts organization that loves this local community and we are reinvesting time and energy in, in audience growth and development and supporting Middle Tennessee. And I am always thrilled to tell people about 40,000 school students or free access to 18 and under to online programming and, and digital collection gratis access. So it makes me excited to share that there is something for everyone and I, I hope that you'll experience it with us. The Country Music Hall of Fame Museum is a not-for-profit and, and uh, it was uh, created in 1964. We opened a museum in 1967. Um, so we're a 501c3, uh, and, and, and uh, we are governed by a board of officers and trustees. We report up to a group of people who care deeply about what we're doing here and give us great guidance. Um, the collection in the museum belongs to the public. Uh, essential to um, a museum being a good museum is to understand that, you know, once something comes in here, uh, it is our job to be custodians of the collection. We're supposed to take care of it. Uh, we're supposed to engage as many audiences as we can with it. Uh, and we use it in various and sundry ways around here to do uh, that thing. It is hard to imagine a time when the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum was not in its present location in downtown Nashville, near all of the other stuff, the Predators Arena and the Ryman and the Symphony and the upcoming National Museum of African American Music and all of that stuff that we think of as Nashville. But it wasn't always there. Tell me about what happened before it came to be, in broad strokes, where, where, where it is today. It's not, it's not 10 years old. Uh, it, is an, it is an amazing time at the museum and just the trajectory of the museum has been really stunning. We're a little more than 50 years old and we started off in Music Row and worked our way to downtown Nashville in 2001 and then moving to the south of Broadway neighborhood in 2001 it felt as if it might be a big risk as town <laughs> was developing and it turned out to be perfect and just kind of a, one of the jewels in the city's crown that we're just so proud of and so proud of the ability to tell Nashville's story and musical heritage story, so it's great. I don't think I ever saw the previous Country Music Hall of Fame and it's in its Music Row location, but I would imagine there's a difference in size. There's a tremendous difference in size, there's, and there's been scaling throughout time. It was a pretty traditional, although museum building, building um, in Music Row that really paid tribute kind of to the cottage industry that used to be Music Row in the sweet bung bungalows. It was a museum to fit that scale, hmm. frankly, and fabulous and wonderful and national in scope and did great work. And when moving downtown, there was just such a need for more space. The collection continued to expand and everything is based on the collection, which is now two and a half million artifacts deep, which is awesome. Um, Say that again, two and a half million pieces of, of, of artifact slash object. It's really diversified. So when you think of museum collection or you think of us, you might think of performance costumes or instruments. Mm -hmm. And it is those things, but it is also a massive sound, recorded sound collection, 
film collection, TV, business documents, photographs, so much more because we're telling a multimedia and American history and culture story. So the touch points are so varied and also important. Not only do your artifacts grow in number, but I suspect your visitors grow in number over the decades. What kind of numbers are we talking about in recent years? Yeah, we're really, really fortunate for all of the energy around the town and interest in country music and just building expansion. The, the building doubled in size um, in 2014. So fully open now a facility that is 350,000 square feet downtown. And there was very much a demand for that. Now we have about a million two visitors and it's pretty significant wow. it makes it one of the most visited museums in america which is just a huge source of pride for us and for nashville to truly be a home of a very international museum and about 14 percent of all of our visitors come to us internationally at this point which really speaks to the goodness of the town uh, the exhibition program needs to be really balanced and so we're really out there um, looking at everything that's happening in this world that we define as country. And I would say that probably we are defining it more democratically than, than a lot of people are. In other words, it's not um, only what is heard on the radio, you know, hot country artist. It is um, all the stuff around it, all of the edges around that. Uh, and so the process that we go through is a few of us are in a room and we are putting forward who we think uh, is worthy of an exhibition and then there is some fighting and screaming and arguing and, and, and we end up with who we think we should do. Uh, it, it goes without saying that the, that, the, that, the, that the folks, the people, or the subjects that we're looking at we think are, are integral to telling the story that we're trying to tell. Well, the museum has a large community focus. Um, we see ourselves as telling this huge story of country music, which has a lot of local roots, right? Um, and we do see ourselves as having responsibility to share that story with everyone. And sometimes that means leaving the building, which we do a lot. So we go to a, um, all of our public library branches and we have a partnership with Metro Parks where we go to community centers and parks. Um, we go to a lot of festivals. Um, we go outside the county. We go just about everywhere that we can get an invitation, or sometimes we invite ourselves. Um, to provide different sorts of programming. Usually that those programs are around music making or art making. We have a very popular program that travels called the Musical Petting Zoo, where you get to try different instruments and learn about different instruments in country music. And we take some professionals with us to help with some guided instruction. The CMA, it is their Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And we are the home for it so visitors can come and touch it and be close to people that have made an indelible impact in the music and honor them. The other piece I find really interesting about the museum and CMA is CMA uh, birthed the idea of us. The Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum was looked at by the CMA board of what do we do to spread, spread this language of country music more broadly and there was consideration around a country music pavilion or a museum at a world's fair wow. and going <laughs> back to speak to our space on Music Row and build a museum they found it to be more cost effective and permanent versus the pavilion mm -hmm. to build a permanent muse museum on Music Row so the rest is history. They were very wise in knowing if we're creating a museum that that has to be its own entity. So when the museum idea evolved, it immediately separated from CMA and became its own nonprofit mm -hmm. organization so that um, this collecting and history telling couldn't, could, would not be as influenced by the commerciality and other pieces. So it's a non-biased reporter and repository for this wonderful American story. Wow. CMA very much does manage the Hall of Fame process. And it is a, a, a top secret, but very <laughs> sure. well advised right. process where they look at candidates in three categories. Mm -hmm. And one category is folks that have had a career of 20 years. The other is a year of 40, a career of 40 years or more. And the, the third is a rotating category that goes from musician 
uh, songwriter, and then all other aspects of the industry. So one changes every three years, and then very artist focused with the other two in a in a more veteran and more uh, modern cat categorization. It's it's really wonderful and. Um, amazing to see what what how the process evolves. They range from people who might not know much about country music or think that they like country music to people who are super fans about country music. So our guests also come from all over the world and they come from just across the Cumberland River. So we really see ourselves as um, educating anyone who comes into the building, but we also go out of the building um, to different places in Davidson County and around Middle Tennessee. So really our audience is just about everyone. So we talked about these huge numbers of tourists that come from around the country and around the globe to visit the Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, let's talk about good old Nashvillians. We can't leave us out of the mix. What can locals do on a, even a weekly basis. There's, there's a reason for us to engage at the Country Music Hall of Fame, too. Thanks for asking. Even though the museum is global, it is hyper-focused on local community. One of the things that we have done that I'm most proud of from an institutional level with great guidance from our, our board was make the museum free for everyone in Davidson and bordering counties ages 18 and under. So that is true for all time. The goal for us is really engagement and providing opportunities for, for young people to know their cultural her heritage and participate in an organization that people visit as a lifetime destination that is a constant resource with something free fresh all the time. We're, we're hosting about 12 exhibitions a year. Oh my goodness. T more than <laughs> 1,200 educational programs every year. So there's just ways to connect and ways to be a meaningful part of the museum's fabric for locals and just always encouraging folks to take advantage of it. Um, one of my most favorite partnerships among the Community Counts umbrella is one with the Nashville Public Library. And as, as if you are a Davidson County Library, public library card holder, mm -hmm. you, can, you can check out a Community Counts Passport, which provides free admission for two adults to visit the museums. If you want to check it out, you haven't been before, and just have that experience, our standing programs. So every Saturday, you can come to a songwriter session. Every Sunday, um, you can learn more directly from a great musician, and that's all part of of your experience with admission. So I, I, I know that how popular songwriter sessions have become with the, with the, ex, the demand for Bluebird and other places. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, this is a touch point and there's a theater with 240 seats and you can just pop in as part of your museum admission. So checking out the calendar on our website at countrymusichalloffame.org to see what is happening with admission is core. One role that I think that we have here is to um, not only document what's going on, but also report on what's going on now and try to connect how the past might have influenced the, uh, the future, you know, or the present. Um, and again, you know, I don't think that you get a million, 200,000 people to walk through to come to a museum every year unless you are really looking at the subject matter very broadly. A great day for us is when we are talking to visitors through marketing surveys or whatever, exit surveys, and we say, why did you come here? And uh, Outlaws and Armadillas is sort of tied with um, LBT, with Little Big Town, right? I mean, that and what we're hope we're doing is you get people in who are really interested in one part of the music, but we introduce them to another part of it. There's not just things for adults. Um, there are things for youth too. And weekends during out of school time, there are really thoughtful family and youth programs that are tied to exhibition content. Cool. And it's just drop in kind of makerspace things that is thematic based. There's also on the other side, instrument-based program. So we're really proud to offer, if you've never played guitar or mandolin or banjo, we'll put them in your hands wow. and you can walk away with the satisfaction of having a chord under your belt. And um, hopefully that continues to propel, propel interest. Even beyond the physical museum itself of ways to get involved and what do we have for Nashvillians, my name is Danielle McCoy and I'm the volunteer manager here at the Country Music Hall of Fame um, and I get the most fun job of all time. I get to uh, look after all our volunteers as well as all our interns here at the museum. 
Um, we have lots of really fantastic, great opportunities to get involved here. Um, we have a lot of experiences where you can give back to the community, meet a lot of people from all around the world that come in and visit here at the museum. Um, we have really great roles to do. We have opportunities to get involved with school tours. Um, these are real fun. We have uh, K to 12 students that come for field trips and we have volunteers that take them through the museum and teach them about country music history. We also have really great opportunities to get involved with our uh, adult education programs. These are our public programs, so these are our songwriter sessions, our concerts, our panel discussions, um, as well as our youth and family programs. So these are our uh, volunteer opportunities for um, working with young people. So you work with a lot with uh, arts and crafts or musical instruments, teaching kids how to play banjo. Um, you don't need to know a lot about country music history. You also don't need to know how to play an instrument. We teach you everything you need to know. Uh, it's a really great opportunity to get involved behind the scenes here at the museum, uh, as well as meet new people, learn new things, and have a lot of fun. So every Saturday we have um, a songwriter session and this is a performance-based program. We have a hit songwriter that comes in, um, performs some of their songs, tell the stories behind the songs. The audience gets to ask them questions about their creative process or the music business. Um, usually they'll stay after and do a meet and greet. So it's a really cool opportunity for um, a lot of people who just love songwriters and come every week and get to hear them in this beautiful theater with great sound and some people who've just never met a person or seen a person who has that kind of a job. Let's talk a minute about the, you say multimedia, um, let's talk about the giant room that you have where I think, I'm going to get this wrong so you'll need to guide me on this, but uh, uh, with permission a guest can access your media archives, which are photography, video, and sound. Mm -hmm. How how can that be? <laughs> I mean, A, how could I um, benefit from those items and enjoy them? And, and uh, in terms of procedure, how does someone get access to, to those? That's such a great question. Everything in our organization and everything based on being a nonprofit that preserves and collects and makes available the, the story of country music and the richness and beauty is about accessibility. We acknowledge we have 2.5 million artifacts. There are researchers, <laughs> there are uh, journalists, there are people looking for touch points of the story. So certainly we do have an archive and a staff that works on things mm -hmm. so you are able to to visit the website and make requests requests for a visit. It's something scheduled to come and do. But in trying to be focused on the access part, we have a digital archive and we actively secure grants to um, make digital copies of artifacts in our collection. So now oh. you can go to the website and just sort of Google Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum Digital Archive. And we have nearly 100,000 items available for view. And you can keyword search the same way you would on Google and see what we have. And I, I honestly think that's the greatest place to start. See if we have it. And then there's information from the digital archive if it's not yet posted. For us, it's the ongoing mission and action. It's will the work ever be done? It's like, wow, we have a 2.5 million artifact <laughs> collection. We are 100,000 digital artifacts plus deep and you're getting more all the time yeah and it's funding based because it is the hard work of museums to catalog those pieces mm -hmm. if you just think about we live in a world of metadata it's how how do we capture there's a picture of dolly Parton or a recording of i will always love you what are all the keywords you would need to search we'll think wow. of recording who wrote it who played on it when did it happen where was it recorded so thinking through all of those things is requires human beings that can collate all of the information, enter it, so, so it can be found and be vital and viable forever. So it's a huge scope of our work expanding that, and we're really proud of uh, the federal grants we've received to do that work and have a big team on it. But yeah, are working hard towards accessibility for all of, all of the good reasons of spreading, spreading the word and spreading the content. Preserving materials is, in and of itself, noble and important, mm -hmm. but to then be able to have a writer in Northern Ireland who wants to make a book about the history of country music to be able to see 
online things that he needs and to be able to reach out and say, I need to go deeper on this, that's kind of, uh, that's amazing. That's yeah. revolutionary in terms of sharing the art form. And we have about a thousand searches a day through that. So wow. we feel like that is, that, is, that is the ongoing future of how do museums become more accessible in content. Well, I mean, for me, music matters because uh, um, I, I'm able to listen to uh, uh, songs that have been written uh, that uh, help me understand my life and what's going on out in the world. Uh, and I think country is particularly uh, important because essentially it's blue collar music and, 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 and it's talking about uh, in very eloquent ways normal subjects, everyday subjects. And I think that if you look at this music closely enough, in some ways it tells the history of this country, you know. Um, and above above that, it's just great fun to listen to music, right? It's inspiring, you know, it can change your life. You know I'm a word nerd, and <laughs> I read in researching about the Hall of Fame that your mission, this may not be your official mission, but metaphorically your mission is to preserve and interpret the American vernacular in music. What is that, I mean, I know what the word vernacular means, what do we mean by that? Why vernacular in the, in the context of the Hall of Fame? The museum itself and the art form that we studied certainly, and, and, and I need to say that, we really do present country music as an art form, and it's populist and it's folk-based, mm -hmm. and that is a tradition that is so important for cultural organizations to honor and elevate to high art. The commercial audience always does. Mm -hmm. It's fun to do that in the high art space vernacular because often it is the voice of a southern region. It is a voice of a populist people, and that's, that's in, the why. In form and content, I yeah. guess, is what you're saying. The, the way we say what we say and what we're talking about is is rooted American. in an air and it's uniquely American. It is un uniquely based in the South, although is influenced by a number of things and certainly the southernness of it has gone a number of different ways. And it is it is a now a very big tent, but it is always been an inclusive tent. Uh, there has, we're super excited that the National Museum of African American Music is coming near to us yeah. because African American music is a huge part of our story as much as immigrant based music is. And it is, it is beautiful. We need the banjos, we need the fiddles, we need the, the gospel choirs, we need the cowboy music, we need the Appalachian music. It's just a confluence of things that really created some unified and sounds that are uniquely American. One of the other great ways that the museum takes care of Middle Tennessee and is just a, tries to be do our part as a great corporate citizen is through our sustainability initiative. When you move a museum downtown and then it doubles in size and doubles in visitation, one of the things that you create a lot of besides great memories is a lot of solid waste. So sure. trash and just being sensitive to what do you do with this. So solid waste is not all stuff that you would throw away. Some of it has an, a, an ongoing use, or it could. Yeah, upcycling is a really interesting concept for museums. And for us, since we have such a big culinary program, hmm. uh, and, and last year hosted hundreds of events, internal and external, it's kind of stunning, 1,800 plus last Amazing. year. So it's a lot of food and a lot of people and a lot of support. And one of the great things the museum does, with more than 1,800 catered events a year, we take leftover food from those events and we donate it to nonprofits like the Nashville Rescue Mission. And th those, that food translated in the past year to 28,000 meals, which we find to be really meaningful and significant. Wait a minute, 28,000 meals made from sort of extra materials from your own catered events. That's enormous, Lisa. Yeah, we, were, we are so excited about it and so excited about the commitment from the culinary and operations team. It's win, uh, win, win, win. Win, win. And we've really engaged our visitors in uh, sustainability efforts too and have sustainability and recycling um, receptacles throughout the museum and are really proud to see the difference people are making there. It is 
over 130 tons of recycling per Holy year, moly. which is significant. One of the more fun things about that, which is unexpected for a museum perhaps, is that, especially one that focuses on country music history, is we've won some really interesting awards for that work, which is really gratifying. It's important to do good work and mm -hmm. it's important to do good mission-based work, but it's important to do that work well and be aware of your footprint. Sure. So uh, we, we are fortunate to receive the American Alliance of Museums Outstanding Sustainability Award at a national level this year. Um, we received a governor's award uh, in this, from the state of Tennessee, and then the Piedmont Natural Gas Sustainability Award from the Center for Nonprofit Management during the Salute to Excellence Awards this year. So just doing that work and knowing it's, it's sort of may confound expectations, but really showcase the heart of this nonprofit that acknowledges that it, it can give back in potentially unexpected ways is exciting. Not only are you welcoming large crowds, but you are responsibly welcoming large crowds. Well said. Okay, it is my favorite part <laughs> of the interview. It is the speed round, just like the game we used to play when we were kids, where I ask you a question, and the first thing that comes to mind, um, let it fly, and we'll go on to the next one. Great. And if you're wrong, don't fret. I don't okay. think you'll be wrong, though. Okay, you ready? Ready. Speed round with Lisa Purcell. Who was the first person inducted to the Country Music Hall of Fame? There are three initial inductees, and it is Fred Rose, Jimmy Rogers, and Hank Williams. Wow, you caught my trick question. Do you know when? When? 1961. Also a trick question, because that was well before there was a physical building. Okay, cool. Um, tell me something a 10-year-old can enjoy at the Hall of Fame. Elvis's car. Ooh. Tell me something a 50-year-old could enjoy at the Hall of Fame. A songwriter session on a Saturday. Tell me something an 80-year-old can enjoy at the Hall of Fame. Walking through 80 years of American history and seeing it in artifacts and remembering life and connecting past and present. Beautiful. All right. My last question is the easiest of all. What is your website? Our website is countrymusichalloffame.org. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Trish. It was great to be with you.